Hey scholars, Professor Denham here. This is a video announcement for week two of our course HCOM 100, which is online and fully asynchronous. So in this video, I'm going to go over the syllabus and the course schedule and talk about reading the textbook a little bit. Um, there's a, I'll, I'll be I'll be going over some of the things that I've already discussed in the other video, the first video, but now I'll just be going into more detail about some more specifics. But anyway, I hope you're all doing well and let's begin. So I would recommend definitely recommend that you have have your syllabus out in front of you as you're listening to this video. That way you can follow along because I'll be referencing the course syllabus, which obviously, as you know, is available on our course page. So um, as I mentioned before, my office hours, mine is Wednesdays, 1230 to 2. Those are, it, those are my online email office hours. So if you email me during that time, more than likely I'll be able to respond right away with, or within a couple of minutes. Um, if you're on campus and you want to visit me in my physical office, you can you can do that at uh, College Park 27510. So my, my my office is there, and you can visit me in person if you'd like. So make sure you get the uh, the textbook. It's this one, Real Communication, fourth edition. So I've had a few students inquire about using the fifth edition because apparently there there weren't any more fourth editions left at the bookstore. Um, so I'll say this: uh, I teach. I'll be teaching from the fourth edition this semester. However, if if the only one that you can get, or if you already got the fifth edition, you should be okay. And I say you should be okay because generally, uh, when textbooks go from one edition to another edition, oftentimes they don't change that much. In other words, it might change like it might be two percent different or five percent different. Sometimes it's significantly different, where they they take out a chapter or two and they add in a chapter or two, so it's quite different. But from what I could see in, in this edition, which is what I'm teaching from, is the fourth edition. It looks extremely similar to the fifth. I looked at the table of contents for the fifth edition online, and it looks like it's pretty much the pretty much the same structure. So you should be fine. Um, the only thing that might be different is uh, the the page numbers might be off by a little bit. But nevertheless, I when I reference things in the textbook, when I reference things. In the textbook and lectures and then in, in documents and assignments and stuff like that i'm it, i make things pretty intuitive so you should be able to figure out how to follow along if you're using a different edition um you could try to find a, a fourth edition that's let's say used or pre-owned or if someone had it in the course be you know last semester or something like that you can try to get that way so anyhow um, in this course, we talk about communication and public speaking, and I already addressed that last week. But I, I definitely recommend that you read through the entire syllabus thoroughly in detail for our class, for all your classes. So read through the goals, um, objectives. For the requirements, there's a, a variety of learning exercises, three speeches, a paper, and two exams. So the written assignments will be um, the one paper, and then with the speeches, you'll have one of them will be an outline, a full content outline for the um, informative speech, and then a manuscript for the for the special occasion speech. Um, so it's not a writing class, it's not an English class, but but the style of writing is formal. Uh, you should be using 12 point times room and font with one inch margins on all sides. That's for the, um, the application paper. Uh, but for the outline, the outline format's gonna look a little different. I still say use 12 point times room and font with proper margins and proper outline format. But anyhow, that's that for speeches. You're going to deliver three speeches throughout the semester. And obviously those are all, it's all online. So you record your speech and then you upload it to the uh, appropriate module. But the, the thing is the video of your speech has to be one continuous speech with no editing, no no double takes, no second takes, right? So it's just one continuous speech. If, if you're recording your speech and you make an error and you want to start over, start over, but don't, don't sit, don't, don't put things together and edit things together so that there's breaks in the in the in the one video one continuous speech no editing um i mentioned that you're encouraged to have some kind of an audience you don't have to but having someone in the audience that you're looking at as you're giving a speech or even if even if you're not looking at them most students are just looking at the camera lens like i'm looking right now at the camera lens but if i knew that i mean if i had people in my audience if i had people in my room watching me um, some students feel like a greater sense of support, right? Some, you know, you don't need a huge audience, not like you need like 30 people, but let's say a handful of people, friends, coworkers, neighbors, uh, whatever. And that way they're there as a, as a form of support. Now, if you're thinking, oh my gosh, I definitely don't want anyone in the room. Well, they don't have anyone 
don't have anyone in the room. But if you think it might help you, then definitely try to do it. Uh, at least consider it, think about it. But um, that's just something to, to consider. So um, there's two exams, right? I say participation and learning exercises. There's all kinds of different things that you see. If you look at the course schedule, last week we had the profile, the student profile, and the, uh, the Dr. Joseph TED Talk. So those are all part of participation, learning exercises. Um, we'll have uh, a public speaking anxiety workshop. When you submit your informative speech topics, um, we'll have other other exercises throughout the semester where there'll be something on Canvas where you like, give you an assignment, you watch a video, you provide a response. All of those different things are worth anywhere from 15 to 30 points, and they're all under the category of participation participation slash learning exercises. Two exams, midterm and a final. And then I give you a breakdown of, of the grading here. So you can see how each thing in each component is weighted. So you have the application paper, intro speech, so on and so forth. Our course is based on a thousand points. It's a thousand point based course. So it makes things fairly easy to, to make sense out of uh, if you're more of a numbers person. If it's a thousand point, if it's a thousand point based course and you see that, hey, the intro speech has 50 points, 50 points is relative, right? If you have a course that's worth 200 points and then you have a speech that's worth 50 points, that's 25% of the course, right? It's a lot, it's a lot different than only 5% of the course. So our speech, 50 points, intro speech, 5% of the course you read. Um, if that doesn't make any sense, don't worry. You can just know and trust that this system, this, this sort of method makes things just sort of easy in terms of numbers and whatnot. But anyhow, that's that. Um, I already addressed some of these things about you know, corresponding with me and emailing me, um, whatnot. So like I said, I have my office hours where it says Zoom office hours. You can visit me during my office for anything. Um, in terms of technical requirements, you, you definitely need to have some basic computer competency skills and know how to utilize and, and work with uh, YouTube and, and whatever, whatever sort of video recording device you're using for your speeches, whether it's your phone or a laptop or whatever, a uh, webcam. Um, you need to know the basics of that because it's you're it's it's on you you're responsible for ensuring that you do things correctly fortunately there's you know there's youtube so there's all kinds of resources out there that can help you with things you can go onto canvas or you can just go onto youtube i'm sorry you go into um just a, a google search an internet search and then and and you type in like how do i upload a, a video file to canvas and it shows you how to do it it's pretty pretty easy you can always you can always contact the it department within our um university if you're if you're having questions and they can help you out but online class it's fully asynchronous so you, you need to have some basic basic understandings of, of how computers work email and whatnot and so i have some some things on there for netiquette requirements and uh class conduct like the way you're supposed to conduct yourself in an online class this might be um this might be just a, a, a review for a lot of you. You probably already heard about a lot of these things or how to how to be on, online. In our class, we're not having live class sessions and there won't really be a whole lot of discussion boards. So it's it's still relevant for how you communicate online, whether you're just communicating to me, you're recording a video of yourself or you're you're emailing me or um, you're providing your comments on something that's an online assignment. It's important to be mindful and aware of how we conduct ourselves online because it's just different. The way we conduct ourselves online, different than in person, but those are things to be aware of. When it comes to grade disputes, down to uh, page five, when it comes to grade disputes, if there's something that you want to discuss with me about your grade, let's say you, you get your grade back and it's higher than you thought or lower than you thought, or just you just want to talk to me about my feedback or what you did or what, what you did well and how you can be better or what you did poorly and how you can you know improve from that or you just want to talk to me about your work i'm more than happy to have that conversation and that would be something that we do over over zoom or obviously in person if you're wanting to visit me in person so i already talked about late work um so basically you have uh, a deadline essentially everything for the most part for the most part, everything in our class is going to be due on Sunday nights at 11.59 p.m. Um, and for the most part, I will allow for late work. So the deadline is Sunday, 11.59 p.m. If it's if your work is submitted after that time period, then points are deducted. So it's a 10% deduction in points for each 24-hour period. So try to make things pretty easy to follow right there. Um, if three days have gone by, then there's chances are you won't be able to do it again. 
you won't have an opportunity to do the work. So I want to bring it bring to your attention and um, it illuminate the importance of, of Cal State Fullerton's policy on plagiarism and academic integrity, academic dishonesty. It's a really big deal, as it is for most colleges, for pretty much all colleges. They take they take cheating, academic integrity, academic dishonesty, all that kind of stuff. They take it very seriously. I, in my experience of teaching at the college level for 15 years, I've unfortunately I've had a, a handful of these encounters, but also fortunately I've only had a handful and not multiple or several, which is nice. So I'm not trying to scare you, but um, if I suspect that that the work that you submit for a particular assignment, if I suspect that that work is consistent with what is uh, um, what what typically plagiarized work looks like or cheating work looks like, then I'll further do some further investigation. I might uh, compare that with Turnitin. I might contact my department chair and, and search around if, if I suspect that. And it's not that often that I do, but every once in a while I see some work and then I basically do some do some investigating and determine whether or not that that particular work from a student, if it, if it warrants me, if my suspicions warrant um, a, an academic violation, a, an academic dishonesty violation. So if that did happen, what I would do is I would create a report. I'd have to create some sort of academic dishonesty report, or academic integrity violation report. And once I create that report or file or case, I, I send that off to an academic integrity committee, for lack of a better term. And then they are the ones who determine what will happen to you as a student. If they find what I found, if they suspect that your work is, is, is falls under the category of plagiarism or cheating or academic dishonesty, they determine the punishment. They determine what sanctions. I definitely recommend that you look through the university policy statements on this. I provide the, the hyperlink for that within our syllabus, and I have that information on our Canvas page. Again, I'm not trying to scare you, but you should know that some of the possible sanctions for getting caught in some sort of a academic dishonesty or cheating or plagiarism issue within our college, a sanction would be the punishment. A sanction could be um, you got an, an automatic F for the assignment, automatic zero for the assignment or you get an automatic F um, or you are withdrawn from the class, either authorized withdrawal or unauthorized withdrawal, potentially get an incomplete for the class. Potentially you'd be kicked uh, out of that department. Potentially you could lose scholarship funding or your status as a student, or you might have to take a semester off. I don't know the full list of sanctions. There are several, um, but it's important for you to be aware of how those things work. Basically, the way to avoid any sort of anxiety or confusion over all this, do your own work, right? So make sure the work that you're doing is your own original work, and then that you're giving credit to where credit is due. As a college student, at least in this class, I'm not requiring you to create new work. You're not, you're not inventing necessarily, but you're you're researching and you're finding information that's already been created and submitted and published by by scholars and, and whatnot ar across the globe. And it's your job to find good evidence, to find good sources, and then incorporate those into your assignments and then properly give credit to where credit is due. Um, and of course, when it comes to doing your own work, you don't cheat and you're not using any other, anyone else's work and so on and so forth. If you're unsure about what you're doing in terms of whether or not it is appropriate, feel free to ask. I encourage you to ask. So that's that. Um, I have some information about our disability support services and then the, the sexual harassment policy and this emergency contact info. That's it on the um, syllabus. The course schedule, I try to make it pretty intuitive, pretty easy to follow. I have week by week by week. Um, I post all, by the way, I post all my course schedules. I just print them out and I, and I tape them to my, uh, the wall behind my computer here. That way I can always see them. It's not exactly the nicest looking decoration piece in an office, but but then I can see my, my schedules all the time. It's different than having it on your phone or your computer, getting reminders. There's just something unique about having a physical, tangible piece of paper showing you when things are due and whatnot. So as you can see, we're in week two. So we have chapter one and um, that's provided for you. I, I provide you a copy of chapter one. So for those of you who haven't yet gotten the textbook, it's, it's, it's there for you to get you started until you get your textbook. Generally what I'll do is I'll have um, 
uh, I'll have a, I'll, I'll have a module on our Canvas page where it'll say PowerPoint lectures and videos, and then I will have uh, for each week for each chapter I'll have a, a lecture video of me of me lecturing, basically talking to the camera, and then I'll, and then I post that to YouTube, and then I provide you with the link. So you can always go to my YouTube channel. If you look at my playlist, you'll see your course show up as a playlist, and that's where I, I put all of our videos. So a video for announcements, a video for assignments, a video for exam review, everything. Um, so you'll see the video, and then I'll also provide a, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. So the idea is that I'm, I'm trying to simulate the classroom experience to where you're looking at the PowerPoint presentation as you're listening to me talk, and I'm teaching from the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and during that time, I definitely recommend that you take notes. Pause the video when, when, I, when I talk about something that makes you kind of makes your brain kind of think a little bit and you're like, oh, that's complex or that sounds important. Um, I'm not going to say that everything that comes out of my mouth is important, but, but throughout a lecture, I'm going to elaborate on certain things and emphasize certain things. And I'm not going to say, hey, you should take notes on this. You should figure out how to take notes based upon your own method of taking notes. But I recommend that you take notes during that time. You can write it directly into the textbook or type it onto your Word docs or however you, however you like to take notes. But I recommend that you do that during those times. Um, I re and then what, what I would say is I, I, would, I would suggest to you to try to have all your reading done prior to the start of the week. Easier said than done. So chapter one, hey, should have been done by, by Monday. And then for week three, we've got chapters three and six. Try to have that read by Monday of next week, before Monday of next week, and so on and so forth. Um, but if you're not able to get the reading done in the beginning of the week, then then figure out how to how to make that work. Because as a, with an online asynchronous class, you can work whenever you want to work as long as you get the work done. So if you've already read the chapter and I and I still haven't got my PowerPoint video and lecture up, then just kind of sit tight. If, if you see the PowerPoint lecture and video and you haven't read the chapter yet, you could watch the video first and look at the PowerPoint and then read. But I recommend reading first and then listening to me because what I'm doing is I'm, I'm not talking about everything in the textbook. I'm, I'm highlighting things. I'm elaborating on things. But if you've, if, if, if you've already done the chapter reading, then hearing my uh, lecture video and reading through the PowerPoint is going to make a lot more sense. For reading, here's my recommendation for how you should read each chapter. And, and I didn't really start to perfect this, I should say perfect it, but I didn't really start to really work on this style of reading until I got to my PhD program. And once I got to my PhD program, I realized, wow, this is invaluable. To, to be able to read this way, it spends le I spend less time reading and I have more comprehension. It's, a, it's not so much a skill as much as it is like a, a specific kind of exercise. It's a, a certain kind of method of reading that takes some getting used to, especially if you haven't done it yet. But once you figure it out, once you kind of like get the hang of like, all right, so this is how I read the textbook, then it becomes easier. So here's how I recommend reading. I'm just going to use chapter three as an example in our textbook, which if you're on the fourth edition, if you're following along, but you don't have to be. But if you're following along, chapter three, begins on pages 52 and 53 with Tiger Woods. So what most college students do, including myself for most of my college career, the, the, when I first start, with, when I would go to read a, a, a textbook chapter, I would just start off by the first page of the, of the chapter and I just start reading line by line, page by page. Um, and over time, I, I kind of modified the way I read and then the way that works best for me is the following. Take from it what you will, uh, but this worked for me really well. So if, if I'm the student, right, and I'm getting chapter three, the first thing I read in chapter three is the conclusion. Now our textbook has an awesome, in my opinion, has a really cool creative way of, of providing a summary. Instead of just saying chapter summary and then having a paragraph, they say, uh, it says real, real reference, a study tool. And it says, now that you have finished reading the chapter, you can, and it has colon, and it's kind of giving you like a bullet point list of everything that was covered in the chapter. Definitions and so on and so forth. Um, but it's only barely a page, a page and a half. And then essentially you would um, get a, 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 a concise summary of the whole chapter. And then after reading that, I'd say read that in detail, maybe take some notes on there within your textbook or wherever you take notes. And then after reading the summary, then you read um, 
the chapter outcomes. And so on this one, it says page 54, chapter outcomes. After you have finished this reading, you will be able to describe how our personal perspective, yada, 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 right? That's sort of, that's like a, a chapter outline preview. Um, and then I would just go through the entire chapter and look at the headings, the subheadings, the sub subheadings, perception, making sense of your world, schemas, the function schemas, challenges of schemas. I'm just reading all the headings and subheadings and sub subheadings. I'm just, I'm just sort of like getting that in my brain. I might glance at some of the figures or the pictures or the uh, references to, to art or culture or movies. And then now that I've done my warm up, my, my mental warm up, my reading warm up, now if I really want to kick it up a notch, I'll type a summary, chapter three summary. Um, and I might have a running document that says uh, chapter summaries for HCOM 100. HCOM 100 chapter summaries, Word document. And and every every time you read a chapter or every time you do the, you read the, the summary, the intro, the chapter outcomes, all the headings and subheadings, then you have a pretty good idea. You should have a pretty good idea of what that chapter is about. So you have chapter three, sum chapter three summary, you type it up. This chapter is about, and then in a couple sentences, maybe one, two, three sentences, if you had to summarize it, how would, how would you summarize this chapter in your own words? Grammar doesn't matter, spelling doesn't matter. But when you do this, it, it sounds like a lot of work, but once once you get the hang of it, it's really not that much work. When you do that, now you have a much more focused and strategic approach to how you're going to read the chapter, which you actually start like reading, right? Now you have a sort of a lens in your mind's eye uh, such that you're able to, to do a better job of strategically skimming through the chapter. And that way you're not reading everything word for word, but you've done this mental warm up, and now your, your brain and your, your body's like ready to like get into the chapter and spend, and, the, and it, once you start figuring this out, the, the benefit is you spend less time reading and you have more comprehension and you have more focus. That's my recommendation to you, but, uh, you know, do what works as long as you do the reading and as long as you understand what you're reading and you have comprehension and you have a system, and you have a method, go with that. There's, there's a, a, all kinds of ways that you can read, but choose one that works for me. That worked for me, um, you know, for, and for having been a college student for 12 years, you know, there's, there's something to that. Anyhow, um, I hope you're all doing well and, uh, yeah, I guess I will be talking later. Have a great day.